Thank you, Michelle. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Um, I'm Michelle Hussein, and it's my pleasure to be um, hosting tonight's um, discussion. Um, clearly, Egypt has been the subject of uh, a lot of debate already uh, here at Frontline this year. Um, I was lucky enough to see those, what it was like in Cairo in those remarkable days in February for myself. And um, on the day that Mubarak fell, I was presenting Newsnight, and I was lucky enough to be able to speak to um, Adaf Swaif live, who, with Khaled Abdullah, who's already here, actually walked halfway across Cairo to get to our live position and get on air so um, which in the scale of things is now seems obvious but I know it was quite a trek on that night so um Thank you for doing that. Thank you um, for being here. And um, it's especially nice for me to be part of this because actually when I went to Cairo, I felt like I knew Zamalik really because of uh, your book. So, um, so you know, your writing on your works of fiction and also your um, uh, your commentary is familiar to lots of people here. Um, I thought we, we were lucky to have quite a lot of time um, available. And I know there'll be loads of questions from all of you. I wonder if I could just start, um, Adaf, by asking you to kind of go back to how it was at the beginning, because now we know how the Mubarak story ended, at least the actual time in power ended. But, you know, you got on a plane, you went to Cairo uh, when all of this unfolded. You know, what were your feelings, what were your thoughts when you first arrived, and how did you think it was going to end? Uh. <laughs> See, it feels like a long, probably feels like a long, long time ago now. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, right, well, I was in Jaipur at the uh, literary festival in, in Jaipur, and any of you who've been there will know what a self-enclosed world it is. And the 25th was the last day, and I had a panel in the morning, my last panel. <coughs> so I did that from 10 to 11.30, and then I went off into the town because I hadn't done any, I hadn't looked at Jaipur, I hadn't done any shopping. And so I just went off on my own and walked around and didn't know anything at all. And I got back to the hotel at about sort of 7 p.m. and uh, found that my phone had been off. And so I switched it on and there were messages. What do you think of what's happening in Egypt? You know, on and on and on. I thought, well, what is happening in Egypt? So I went to my room. Mm -hmm and switched on the television and then I remembered that um, I was I was in an old hotel that used to be an old palace which was really lovely but not very up to the minute and I had only ever been able to find a shopping channel on my <laughs> TV so I switched on and there was the shopping channel so I ran back to reception got somebody to come and fix it and got CNN and there was Cairo with sort of thousands of people in the streets and and so on so um so I called my sister, which is what I always do. When in doubt, call your sister. And, um, and found out what was happening. And so basically, I, I, I was supposed to stay. I was supposed to go to Delhi next day and then stay there for five days. So I still had to go to Delhi um, because I couldn't fly from Jaipur. So I, I spent the next day getting to Delhi and organizing my ticket to Cairo for the following day and canceling all the things I was supposed to do for five days and so on. And, and I got to Cairo on the 27th um, in the early evening, and I phoned up to say, where should I go? Like, you know, where's the revolution? I phoned from the airport. <laughs> and, um, and my niece said, well, it's a bit quiet today, but you could try, um, you know, a certain square in Medinat Nasr. So uh, we went there, but there was nothing. And uh, then somewhere else there was nothing. And so I went home, but the feel of the city uh, was different. I mean, <clears throat> somewhere un under a flyover, there were a couple of wrecked cars, for example. And also, it was too quiet. Now, this is a city which, I mean, I remember driving um, an American friend in from the airport one night. Well, it was like one in the morning, and she'd come to visit. It was her first time, and we were driving back from the airport. And as we entered Cairo, she was looking around saying, you know, what's happening? Of course, nothing was happening. It was just normal. That was sort of how it is. So, but, but this time, it, it really was eerily quiet. Um, however, next day, it all kicked in. So I, uh, I found out, or I was told, where one of the protests was going to happen. So you see, the 25th had happened already. Um, and then there was 26, 27, and so the Friday, the 28th, was, was where it began for me. And it began by um, knowing where one of the protests was going to start, and it was one that was going to start in Mbeba. 
and actually um, having been on it, it turned out when we compared notes at the end of the day that several of my friends, in fact my sister and several of my friends, had been at that same protest. But such was the, I mean, we, ha we hadn't seen each other. Um, and so that first one, it, it, it involved going with a friend to Mbeba, which is on the other side of the river from downtown, from the central, Tahrir Square and basically waiting, uh, just sort of loitering near the mosque, small mosque there down an alleyway where, where that particular protest was going to begin. And um, the preacher just kind of went on forever at the end, he on and on, and then before he finished, a, a shout went up, and it was one of the young men on the shoulders of, of another one or two, and all in all, it was about 15 people. And it started to, um, now, if there are any um, good translators here, you might help me out. We say tehtef and hotef, which is basically that shout, that mix between a shout and a chant and a cheer that you must have heard if you were following um, the Egyptian revolution. Chant is wrong because it's kind of, you know, too kind of, uh, you know, dead and slow. And cheer isn't right either because it's one rather than a, a sequence. Um, and I, so I don't know what it is, but anyway, anyway, it's a very rousing and sort of makes your, your heart go with it. And um, so basically that started and we started moving through the streets. And it turned out that the idea was that this core group goes through the neighborhood. Um, and the particular chance that go up are the ones that are designed to attract people and make them come down from their homes and join the protest. But was this, was it, was it organized or this was just spontaneous? I mean, this sort of begins and there's a groundswell and then people start joining you. Mm. Is that how it felt to you? Well, that's how it felt to me. Of course, I would, no, I mean, obviously it was organized in the sense that there was a young, there was a group of young people who were hanging about knowing that this was what they were going to do and waiting for the right moment at the end of Friday prayers, because of course, the end of Friday prayers is the time when you get most um, collections, most gatherings of people. And so if you want to you know, make something happen, that's the time that you hit. So obviously it was organized and that these people who knew each other, say 15 people in this particular location knew that another 15 and another and another and another in several locations and not just in Cairo, were all going to start doing this at the same time. And that all these groups were going to go around their particular neighborhoods, encouraging people to join the protest until a certain moment came when they, either it was already agreed what time or a critical mass was reached when all these different protests were going to converge upon the heart of whichever city they were in. So to that extent, you could see and be definite that it was organized. Beyond that, I should think that there were people in the district who knew that things had happened before, protests had happened before, and they had followed the same uh, pattern, but that you could not tell how many people on this occasion were going to join it. And that that was the great surprise on the 25th, that whereas people knew and there had been an open uh, call, an open announcement and a call to protest, but everybody kind of thought that it would be the same uh, level of protest that had been happening for years uh, and that, you know, a few thousand, you would be extremely lucky. So the scale is, is, what, um, is what surprised everybody. And of course, you, you, just by taking part in this, everyone is already breaking the law, right? I mean, how did it feel to be part of something that for most Egyptians was, you know, utterly unknown that they were crossing a barrier just by, just by gathering in, in numbers? Well, I must say that it didn't even occur to me to wonder or to ask that question. And I don't think it occurred to anybody because the law has been so ridiculous. I mean, if the law says that by being five people in a room, you're breaking the law, then surely you have to forget about the law. But it had been you know, obeyed for, that for a long time. Law. Um, well, no, it hadn't, because you had groups like Kefaya, for example, like uh, the, um, you know, all this, the, 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 the sort of grassroots groups that have actually, in the end, been the channels that have led to this revolution. 
they have all been disobeying the law every single time that you had a group of lawyers standing outside their syndicate or a group of even judges standing in protest in the streets, they were breaking the law. And so essentially we have all been breaking the law for a very long time. And this I suppose when you come to it, one felt more secure with this because it was so much bigger. Um, and it was always the case that if you had 200, 500 people on the street, then you would have, um, you know, three times your number of security with, you know, the full riot gear and so on encircling you so that you would always have at least three layers of security encircling you. And you certainly felt very, very vulnerable and, you know, bad things happened. So this, to find yourself in the middle of something that started out being 15 people and then was growing so that you looked up and down the street and you couldn't see the end of it, and to know that everywhere all over the country similar things were happening and to be wondering how big they were, and it, it just felt, it, it felt much, much more safe and solid to the point where you didn't really even at that point think about um, security and police that came that came later and you you spoke about um, the the young people organizing it uh, when when you when you were there uh, whether in Tahrir or elsewhere did you feel it was a cross section of society i mean as you looked around you what were your impressions about who was there who was who was represented mm. well we uh, of course we say and it's true that the young people organized it and um, and that they, they led it. Um, when you speak to young people from among the organizers, they, in, in typical courteous young Egyptian fashion, say that it wouldn't have happened if we oldies hadn't spent a long time, <laughs> like sort of decades, um, doing... <laughs> doing what we did and that you know they are building on, on, on the work that has gone before them and so on, but certainly they are the organizers. Um, however, they also say that they can claim credit for about 20% of the people who went out on the 25th. So mind you, on the 25th, 28th was bigger and it kept getting bigger and bigger. So basically it was a moment whose time had come. And certainly when you looked around you, now I can only claim to know about Tahrir and certain areas of Cairo. Um, but if you looked around you there, within, I mean, once peace had happened, I mean, you know, when it wasn't a day when you were actually being attacked um, by regime forces, then it was four generations. It was four generations of people. It was cross sectors of society, both um, economically and in terms of uh, like rural and urban. Um, t other cities and towns in Egypt sent delegations to Tahrir to make sure that they were represented there. So they were there with their banners and their flags because it was accepted that decisions would come out of Tahrir. And so they were there to give it legitimacy and to be part of the process of decision making. Um, you had people who were declaredly uh, people who worked for daily wages. In other words, when they don't work today, they don't get any money and their families don't eat. So that is like really poor. You had people who parked their Mercedeses by the opera and came to join the protests. It was everybody, um, you know. So, uh, so, so it was started by the young people. It was um, joined by everybody in Egypt, and from the beginning, even people who didn't, um, yeah, yeah, walking through those streets of Mbeba to go back to that first day, um, and the, the 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 chants were to do with um, "We're your brothers, we're your children. Everything we do, we do for you." Um, come down for your homes in order to get your rights. Um, uh, beans and oil have become, you know, they've raised the price of beans and oil, soon you'll be selling your furniture. So this was all addressed to the people up there in the houses, and a lot, a lot, a lot of them, I mean, obviously every balcony was full of people. And the women, and it's just occurred to me why, I was just about to say that the women were far more expressive than the men. So the women would be, uh, you know, waving and laughing, and later on when the uh, 
the gas bombs started, they would be giving onions and things that would help us. And uh, the men were there, but and now, of course, of course, I can see that the men were really under an obligation to come down and join, while the women had the leeway to sort of, you know, support from their homes or come down if they wanted. But the men, it was like, where are the men of this district? Why aren't you down here with us? And so I suppose it made sense for the women to be happier as they stood <laughs> on their balconies. Um, you, you mentioned prices, and I just wonder how much you think the spark for all of this was economic? The economics have been going on for a very long time. Without the economics, maybe it wouldn't have happened. I mean, if people were not so um, ground down and so really unable to see a future for themselves and for their children, then maybe you wouldn't have had a revolution. But it wasn't, it wasn't really the spark. I mean, it's really hard to say a particular spark. You, 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 can, you can say. Um, you can pinpoint several things, one after the other, that cumulatively led to this moment. And they're really varied. So the economics is ongoing um, and, and peaks at times when you, when you have, for example, um, queues for bread and then somebody dies in a queue for bread. Uh, or when you have queues for um, butane gas, cooking gas. And, and, and then there's a crisis and its price goes up. And of course, everybody knows that at the same time, we're kind of subsidizing gas to Israel, so where we're selling our gas at, at sort of, you know, no, at nothing, at subsidy. And, and meanwhile, we haven't got it. So these, these things are always there and they peak, they go up and down. But then you have things like, for example, uh, the bombardment of Gaza. The bombardment of Gaza and the Egyptian uh, collusion in the siege of Gaza. This, this was a really, uh, you know, very much a, a peak thing. Or you have the killing of uh, Khaled mm. Saeed, the young man, I don't know if you've heard, but this young man who was not an activist, was, I mean, you couldn't even have the little sneaky thought that, oh, well, you know, he was politically active, so he knew that he was, he wasn't. And he was simply killed by security forces um, and also killed in public, in, in the street, rather than uh, at least have the decency to take him to a police station and kill him there, you know. Um, so he became an everyman. And, and his the trial of the people who killed him also became a flashpoint. Um, and I'm sure there are um, other, other yeah. sort of things. But one on top of the other. And at the same time, of course, you actually have had a state of civil unrest in Egypt since 2003. In 2003, like here, like everywhere in the world, we had the massive demonstrations against uh, the war on Iraq. And then the war happened, and uh, it, it died, they died down a bit. And then 2004, groups like, well, Kifaya to begin with, and then others started the, the sort of the big tradition of protest, which then was because of the elections. Um, and things haven't stopped till, since then. I mean, they, they, they go up and they die down, and other sectors of society join them. And we've had workers' strikes, we've, we've had even civil servants' strikes, we've even had protests by pensioners because of the conditions under which they... So civil unrest, really, for the last six years. And what, what is your understanding or your instinct now about what, what was going through the mind of Mubarak and those around him in, in, those, in those days? I know it's going to be, but, you know, I'm just thinking about those speeches that, you know, um, particularly the speech 24 hours, you know, before, before. he actually resigned, mm -hmm. um, when actually everyone was expecting him to go and then mm -hmm. it didn't then happen. Didn't. I mean, what is going, was it that he wasn't talking to anyone? Was, you know, was, was there an effort and it wasn't working? Or was, is he just not the kind of person who would ever listen to anyone? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I mean, I was saying, and I'm sure many, many, many others were, say, were saying that it would have been so marvelous to be invisible in the room where these conversations were taking place. Um, and, and of course, you know, one has no idea whatsoever. There are various stories that, uh, that go around, one being that, uh, you know, the Mubarak, the, the close Mubarak uh, camp was split, group was split into two. On the one side, Ali, his older son, and on the other side, uh, Mrs. Mubarak and Gamel, the younger son who was being groomed for president, and that um, Ali was for sort of, you know, calling an end, calling a halt to the thing and, and stopping. And it was it was Mrs. Mubarak and Gamel who were pushing 
to stay. To pushing to stay, and that there was this constant um, uh, tug of war, this constant conflict between the two groups, and that on the side of the group that were pushing him to stay were the Minister of um, Information and uh, I can't remember who else. I'm sure my nephew here, who and Khaled and so would, would know more than me. But basically, that, that there were these two groups, and that he had said, or it had been agreed that he would leave, um, and then the group that wanted him to stay prevailed, and so he ended up giving that, that speech, and that the army, in fact, had agreed with him that he would leave, and that therefore they were really annoyed that he, you know, got up and said that he wasn't going to leave, um, and, and so on. So um, it's, it's very strange, because, I mean, you know, even that isn't the strangest thing. I mean, when you think that on the, the Tuesday, I can't remember the dates, but on uh, there was a Tuesday when he made a speech. The Tuesday after Friday, the 28th, he mm -hmm. made a speech. And that was the speech, the tearjerker, the one in which he said, I've served my country in peace and in war. I'll step down at the elections. Down the elections. End, yeah. I will not renew. I'm an old man, and all I want to do is die in my own country. And in fact, there was a swing, because you know we're a good people and a kind people. And it was like, well, you know, he really is an old man. And if he has agreed to go, and so on. And so th there was a certain amount of sympathy for him. Um, among the, you know, I mean, obviously not in the hardcore, but, and instead of like waiting for that to, to percolate or spread or see what it does, next day they put the thugs on the streets. And that, the n next day in the afternoon, the Wednesday, they sent in the cavalry and the one camel that was supposed to defeat the revolution. And so, you know, you'd really want to know how. You know, where was that conversation? What did someone say? Did they say, we will send the Haganah, you know, the armies of camels and horses? Or did they say, well, you know, I can rustle up a camel, and I'm going to send that into the Harir? You know, what, what was happening? It was absolutely baffling. It I was mean, I remember what, watching the pictures, and we just didn't know what was going on. It was completely strange, and it just turned everything. It got the people in the square even more determined, because also, it, it, it sort of, Hmm. It, um, it, it objectified, it actualized the battle of images that was going on. In other words, one of the main gripes of everybody, and not just sort of, you know, not just the, the sort of so called intellectuals or whatever, but everybody, was the image that this regime was painting of the people of Egypt to themselves and abroad. So when Mr. Omar Suleiman speaking to Christian Amanpour on the same night as Ehud Barak speaking to someone else, read from the same script and say that the Egyptian people are not yet ready for democracy, you know. Um, when um, the night I was, I was still in Jaipur and the spokesperson for the presidency or for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs came on and he said, da, 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 da. This government knows the people, and it knows what they want, and so that sort of patronizing thing of, of these people being backward, of if this regime doesn't sit on our necks permanently, then you're going to get a society that is so fanatic, so extreme, so violent, there will be rivers of blood that will wash across Europe. I mean, that was just so offensive. And people found it offensive, and people were talking about it in the square and on the street, that they say this, this, and that about us. And people were, were really uh, very pleased to find themselves and to sort of, you know, re-find their own image and redefine it and mm. declare it. And so to suddenly go from a, a sort of a progressive people who know what they want and who are demanding dignity and freedom to being attacked with camels in best orientalist sort of Daniel Pipes fashion. <laughs> You know, was just um, so. You know, who made that decision? Who? So you know, I mean, really, it's. Uh, I I would like to to be there now to listen to what's being said now. You know, yeah. I mean, I'd like a 24-hour a tweet <laughs> from inside the, the Mubarak. <laughs> oh gosh, yeah, to be a fly on the wall. Exactly. Um, I just want to ask you one more thing before before we open the floor to questions. Um, uh, well, actually, also relating to to, to Twitter, actually, is um, that. Night now again. I'm forgetting dates, but the the Monday night before the final Friday, when um, while her name 
was released and appeared um, on television um, and you know made that very emotional appearance on television now was that it was it was the day then it was the Tuesday where we saw loads of people flood into a Tahrir Square and it was supposedly the biggest protest up to that point was that appearance on television there were that two crucial? things there were two things one is that Wael Ghanim had been uh, he a, he'd been a sort of incognito. Wael Ghanim, for those of you who don't know, um, he was the young Egyptian guy who was the, 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 the manager or director of PR for Google in Dubai. And he had set up, I mentioned Khalid Saeed, the young man who'd been killed for no reason by security. Um, he'd set, set up a website called We Are All Khalid Said, And he was the administrator, the, ad the anonymous administrator for this website. And this website was doing good work. And it was one of the prime movers or organizers of the revolution on the 25th. Had those shocking pictures. It, of, yes. Well, the, the pictures had come out on placards before in the streets and so on. But it had, they had the, the, the images of Khalid Said before and after, like normal, and after he'd been um, brutalized and killed, killed by the thugs. And it has to be said also, actually, that one of the, uh, it's not fortunate, but one of the, one of the uh, uh, features that, uh, that, that, that enabled the Khalid Said story to become so big was that his mother was amazing. He had, he has a mother and a sister, and his mother looks like, again, every Egyptian mother. And she was, she was so, um, I, I don't know, I mean, she was so perfect. She was so grieving, but she was so articulate, and she was so brave, but she clearly didn't want to be in any kind of spotlight, but she was there if it would help, and so on. So she had allowed these, these images to be everywhere, and they were very, very effective. Mm -hmm. So Wael Ghanim was, was the, the mover of, of, uh, of, that, of that website um, and anonymous. And then he'd come to Egypt when the revolution happened, as everybody did. Everybody who could buy a plane ticket came. And he'd been picked up among all the activists who'd been picked up. He had been kidnapped, arrested, taken off the streets. And, and so his name, of course, was among the names of all the activists that people were constantly demanding should be released. And when he was released, um, Mona Shazli, this very popular TV anchor, had a, a coup and got him, like, sort of from his detention to the television studio. And he was very emotional. And it was very clear. He was completely unpre I mean, he's a nerd. You know, he's a geek. He sits with <laughs> and so he was completely genuine. He, he kept breaking down. He, he, um, and so, again, that was something that sort of touched people's hearts. and, and um, but something very important happened that day in that interview, which was that after him, Mona Shazli interviewed Egypt's top heart surgeon, uh, Dr. Tariq Halmi. Uh, now, this is a man, he's a heart surgeon, he's extremely successful, he has his own hospital, he's very handsome, he's in his mid-50s, he's wearing an excellent suit, and he's got a fabulous haircut, and he's sitting in the studio, and he tells her, he says, I'm not political, I have never been polit political, I'm a technician, you know, I perform surgeries on people's hearts, and I'm in surgery all day, and that's what I do. But his son had gone, on the protests and he and friends and so on and so he'd gone down to see what was going on and he happened to go down the night you know after the camels and horses they turned the paramilitaries loose on us the thug militias so he'd happened to go into Tahrir as that was kicking in and so what he saw was he saw a group of young people on this side and a group of young people on that side starting to fight and so he said that he, of course, with all the authority of not only his position, but being you know, an Egyptian man of that age and standing and so on, stepped in between them and sort of started to talk them down and to say, um, you're Egyptian and you're Egyptian. How can you be doing this? Da, 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 da. And, so, and he said he kept at it for half an hour. And it seemed to him that everybody had cooled down and everybody had stepped back. And just as he thought that, from behind the front lines of the people to his left came a shower of stones. And of course, those were the Baltagaya, the thugs, the paramilitary. And he said everybody went back five meters, and he was right there in the middle with the stones coming at him. So he retreated, took shelter, and watched. 
And as he watched, he said it became clear to him who was fighting for a cause and honorably and who wasn't. And this was somebody who kept saying that he was non-political. It was something that was revealing itself to him as he stood there. And then the injured started being carried off to a makeshift field hospital. So, of course, being a doctor, he went to help. And then he saw the way that people just naturally organized themselves and how this sort of amazing organization happened. This field hospital sprang up out of nothing and everybody was working. And the last bit of this is that he sent off, he, um, he sent somebody to ask uh, the son of his chief anesthetist to go to his hospital with an order to open the stores and bring a car full of um, you know, bandages and syringes and all the stuff that they needed. And uh, the young man did that, and he went and he got the stuff. And coming back on Asra Neil Bridge to come to Tahrir to deliver this stuff, he was stopped by the thugs. And they took all the stuff. They beat him up, of course, and they took all the stuff. And he said, up to that point, I was OK because after all they must have had their wounded as well but they took everything and they threw it into the river and he said from that point i was staying in tahrir until this revolution succeeded i didn't go back to my hospital i knew where i needed to be and it was i needed to be in tahrir that i think the combination mm. you know that was the same the, night it was the same <laughs> night it was when were el ghanim rushed off in tears mm. The next interviewee was Professor Halmi. Gosh. I would. I know that there, are lots of, there, there are lots of journalists here, and I actually would urge um, everyone uh, who's interested to have a look at YouTube because you can see this Mona Shazli interview, and it's got subtitles in English, and it's uh, it's a gripping piece of television. It's a very different kind of interview to what you would see um, on um, on most Western news channels. So I would highly recommend it to anyone. Um, please raise your hand if you've got a question. We'll get the microphones around the room. Um, thank you. I think these um, lady in the second row and the gentleman there. Um, and then someone with both. Go ahead. Hi. I have a twofold question about where things are at now. Um, all the way through, I was wondering about the army and how they might be able to um, be on the side of the people and support it. And I wondered about the, the referendum. I spoke on the weekend to my Egyptian cousin in Cairo and asked her how they were feeling now. And she said that they're not happy with the result of the referendum and they're deeply suspicious of the referendum and how it, it uh, was conducted. And they are waiting to see, but they're, they're very nervous about it all. And I just wondered what, where you think things are at now. I mean, the army, surely, with its economic interests, can't afford to allow too much. But on the other hand, they have uh, a different way of, of dealing with things than the, the regime. Yeah, sure. The regime before. OK. Uh, do, do you want, sh um, we, or should we like sort of yes, take, well, you, if you, if you, if you just in ask, case yeah. we can put things yes. together? And, that and we'll be, take that I'd question happy to as do well. That, of yeah, course. I think it's a good idea. Okay. Uh, I was interested in what you said, that there were people from the country side in Tahrir Square. And also, following on from that, the reporting we had tended to be in the sort of Cairo, Suez, Alexandria Triangle. And I just wondered what had been the reactions in Upper Egypt. Thank you. And um, yes, go ahead, sir. Slightly similar question. You mentioned that people came in from other cities and the countryside because they knew that Tahrir was where decisions would be made. That Can you describe how decisions were made? How did the process within the square work? How did people align themselves? How did either? a viewpoint emerge. Right. OK, so question about the, the, the role yeah. of the army in referendum and the nervousness about the result and people coming in, what the feeling was outside Cairo, Suez and Alexandria. And, and I think you were asking about the, the sort of, yeah, the, the sort of democratic process. Yeah, the democratic of, process, you know, of, of within the square, yes. Within, having, within, yes. The, within the protest yes. movement. Thank you. Sure. Also, what I was trying to do and tripping myself up hugely was I thought I might stand up because I can see people at the back <laughs> really sort of trying to... Would this, would this be better? I'm so sorry. I should have thought of this earlier. Okay, all right. Let me sit here. 
Will this take me? Am I going to fall over? <laughs> no, I now? think you look, you look fine. Uh, be a falling over comic rather than a stand up comic. <laughs> okay. Um, I will try to answer these questions to the best of my ability. What I understood. Um, about the decision-making process in Tahrir when I was there. And also, I will say that there are people in the room who have been in Tahrir far longer than I have, who spent nights in Tahrir. I never spent the night, I have to say. Um, so if I say anything wrong, please, guys, correct me, truly. You know who you are. <laughs> OK. Um, now, what was happening in those 18 days was that there, people were forming into circles on the ground. So by evening time, um, you would see, I don't know, 150 circles, whatever, of people sitting around talking. And they were all talking politics, and they were all talking ideas. And essentially, when a group sort of agreed on something, it would pass over to other groups. And eventually, there was a sort of central, what they called an Izea, broadcasting house, which was basically a microphone um, with people in charge of it. And an idea, if it was good enough, would reach the microphone and would be broadcast. And it would be either booed or cheered, <laughs> and hence adopted. Um, and that was really kind of, and that was amazing to watch. That was sort of like democracy on the ground in, in, in action. So that was how uh, originally things happened. And also, things went up on, pla on eventually, like for example, the demands of the revolution. There would be a banner with all of them written as they had come out of Tahrir, and it would be unfurled, and there it would be for it. And then it was updated, like the following, the following million uh, people protest. They were always Tuesday and Friday. Um, that banner would be updated, and that was the decision-making process that was that was happening. Mm. Um, on on uh, the issue of outside. Yes, of course, the nexus was Cairo, Alexandria, Suez. And this was where also the big, I mean, this is where the regime concentrated its forces. And this is where the battles, the main battles were fought. And this is where you can say that the, un OK, please, will you help me out here? <laughs> yes. This is my nephew, <laughs> Ali Abdel Fattah, major blogger and activist. And he's speaking tomorrow in a similar event, but at the Royal Institution. Please, have uh, so, so there were um, there were more cities than just Cairo, Alexandria, um, um, Suez, but uh, but it was all in cities. So all of the so all of the canal uh, cities uh, were uh, in revolt and were completely liberated in 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 the first week of the revolution. Uh, Smalia joined in to help Alex um, Suez. Actually, it was there was a call that was made. People of Malaya, please revolt so that they would have to divert some security forces there because Suez was under siege. So Suez, Port Said, and Malaya, Mansoura and Mahalla, who are industrial um, uh, city centers. towns, yeah, centers. So you, you had the labor movement there, uh, and. Uh, and obviously Cairo and Alexandria, um, these combined are already almost half the population. Uh, uh, Sheikh Zwaid and Arish in That's Sinai. Sinai. And uh, then in, in Upper Egypt, there were cities. They were never as big, so they were never completely liberated. But there were like Aswan and Luxor, which is very strange, because Luxor is not really a very coherent community. And so on. that's the first time we see protests there. And sometimes in Asyut and in Minya and in Enna. But it was nation, essentially, you're saying nation it was nationwide. Yeah, wide. but it was always in cities. Mm. So there wasn't mm. stuff happening in rural areas or villages. They'd join. They'd move to the cities and join there. Well, we had in Tahrir, we had people from rural areas camping out in Tahrir. And, and, and a great many of the people who actually slept over in Tahrir slept over because, I think I lost the mic, slept yes, over, be, but if you can hear me, that's fine, mm. slept over because they had come from so far away and because of the cost of coming and going. And so they just stayed over in Tahrir. So that's that one. Now, on the issue of the army and the referendum and where we are now. Um, the referendum. Okay. Now, the 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 army, of course, is is a is a very um, de debated point. Um, there had to be an institution, a state institution, that would take control, that would be given control. Nobody wanted the Speaker of Parliament. Nobody wanted the Vice President. You know, so basically, those avenues were closed, and so the only body that could take control was the army. Um, 
the army is not unpopular in Egypt. It's very much part of Egyptian society. It is uh, considered to have an honorable record insofar as its dealings with the people are. Um, this time, if it is true, and things will become apparent, if it's true that they did refuse an order to fire on the people, it will be the third time that they have done this, 77 and 85, and then now. And that, of course, is, um, is recorded for them. Um, it's even considered that their military defeats were because of treachery, because they were sent out to fight a war which their leaders had already sold or lost. And so basically, you know, people are okay with the army. On the other hand, of course, nobody wants military rule. And part of what's going on is that you want an end to the military rule that we've had for so long. <coughs> so there's always a, a kind of a push and pull. Now, again, everybody knows that uh, that they represent so much of the um, of the business interests of the country, but also, like the rest of the country, they are not one thing with one lot of interests. There are the people at the top who, of course, have made a great deal of money there, the, and so on. Um, there's also a question as to how much does the bulk of the army really want to be this fat cat business army? And how much would they really like to be an army that respects itself and that actually is an army that you know um, that is serious? So these are all questions. Um, the, the policy of the Egyptian people has been to co-opt the army, to mount a sort of psychological campaign towards the army to, ca to keep on saying the army and the people are one hand, to surround each tank as it appears on the street, to embrace the tanks as they appear on the streets, to throw their babies to the soldiers, to be photographed with them, to sleep on the treads so that they can't move their tanks in the night when nobody's noticing. You know, to, to, to really, um, a great part, we think, of the yes vote in the referendum was in order to get the army off the street quickly. We feel that the army doesn't want to be in the position it's in. The army would rather not be policing the streets, not be in, in this position. <coughs> but that if things go on, then they might develop an appetite for it, or they might be pushed into it, or whatever. That position is consolidated. and so. For the moment, their wish and the wish of civil society is the same, that they get off the streets. And they can't until we have got a functioning government. And we can't have a functioning government until we have a constitution that at least in part says, and so on. So basically, we've had a referendum. Most people that I have spoken to, even people who have voted no and been outvoted, believe that the referendum was conducted fairly. Um, I think we're seeing a bit of um, a bit of undue worry about uh, about the Islamists and about the old God, because I mean the, people are afraid that the NDP will come back, the National Democratic Party will come back in because they're the ones with. Um, with infrastructure and organization. But the NDP never won an election except by fraud. And so if you're going to have elections that are not fraudulent, why are they going to win them? <laughs> you know. And also the Islamists, well, if we have free and fair elections, let's see what proportion of the vote the Islamists will get in a proper free and fair. They're part of the texture of Egyptian society. And you know, um, just because I'm secular doesn't mean that I object to their existence or to their being part of the political power in society. We've got to find the genuine balance of Egyptian society and work with it. So, you know, I mean, I, I, I can see and I think that people I, I've talked to and asked and so on would agree that on the whole, the process is very much going in the right direction. Not everything that happens is a good thing. And the army still drags people off the streets and brutalizes them, but it's an army, you know. 
I mean, it is. You know, they're not sort of. That's what they are. They're soldiers, and the sooner they are out of this position, the better. But of course, people are also pressing for for this to stop, and for anybody, any officer who does this to people to be tried, and so on. So it's an ongoing dialectic, which we hope will carry on in a reasonable way until we safely get to a point where we have elected bodies um, starting to run the country. Okay, a few more questions. There's a lady here and you have your hand up and... Um, <laughs> okay, and um, do, how, do we have two microphones or three? We've got two, okay. So, um, lady here, gentleman there, and then I'll come to um, the front row here. Two quick questions. Um, could you tell us anything about how, what part women are playing in the political process now? Uh, because obviously it was thrilling to see women playing such a big part in the revolution, uh, but we're not hearing very much now about, about the role of women. And the second thing is that, um, unlike you, most of us weren't able to jump on a plane and go to Cairo. We had to follow the media. And a lot of us were glued, especially to TV uh, uh, reportage. But I personally couldn't wait to read what you were writing. I think the pieces that you wrote were superb and are uh, in, in, importantly, uh, incredibly important historical documents, apart from anything else. Thank you. Uh, and I'd like to find out a little bit more about the process of your writing, your experiences, and your observations. OK, thank, thank you. you. Can we get that microphone here? Yes, if you go ahead. Hi, is it me? Your yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. You talked there for about that critical turning point about Khalid Said of the violence coming into the public domain in a very visible way. And it seems to me that one of the things that the regime sustained for decades was this wall, partition, between the known and the unknown, the visible and the invisible. And I wonder whether, looking a little bit ahead, maybe some time ahead, whether you think we need a truth and reconciliation process in Egypt. We need to bring things out into the open so that we can have a true debate and discussion about what's happened, not just in the last few years, but over Beautiful. many decades. Thank you. And go ahead. And um, a few sorry. days before the Egyptian revolution took place, I remember um, watching Tony Blair on TV in an interview, um, and he mentioned that the revolution should be controlled. Um, being from <laughs> Iraq, I found that really frustrating because <laughs> it kind of sent the message that if you want to be a democracy, it has to be through us, um, which by definition, I mean, it wouldn't be a sovereign country, you know? Um, how, do you see that as an attack on Egyptian um, sovereignty? And also, I mean, Tony Blair being in the quartet, um, how do you think Egypt's role is going to change regarding Israel-Palestine? I notice you're wearing a, a Palestinian flag on your right hand. <laughs> Thank you. I think let's do those three. Oh, OK, we'll do this. Okay. <laughs> All right. And I will also try to, to not going be, for. I'll try. I, I, I sort of go on at length. <laughs> well. I mean, anyone who's read me about. knows who, how I work. Huh? How, many, how many pages was it? <laughs> OK. Um, right, well, truth and reconciliation, I think, again, this is something that I have heard spoken about and spoken about as very much a possibility, because, of course, you have you have many foot soldiers who were involved in crimes against people who you, you're not going to um, eliminate them from society. You're going to have to somehow rehabilitate and accept and bring in. And, and actually, I think that, um, I think that in Egypt, a, a truth and reconciliation process would probably be very successful. Um, if it was genuine and if it came at the right time, it would be it would be successful. We're not a, a vindictive people. I mean, it's really interesting that even now, knowing all the things that Mr. Mubarak did and knowing all the money he, I mean, because it's not just that you know that he stole the money. It's it's what people have been living through. You know, the people that this money was stolen from. What lives have they led day to day? What illnesses have they not been able to treat? What education have they not been able to have? And even with that, you know, I mean, there's really no appetite to see him dragged through the streets or anything. It's just sort of stay away from us and give us our money back, you know? <laughs> I, very, well, like it's so decent, begins. Anyway, so yeah, so truth and reconciliation, um, right? Uh, the role of women, women in the political women. process. Women. Um, well, 
I, I mean, I hope that the channels that you've been watching and so on have actually given a picture of Tahrir that showed all the women there. You know, young women, old women, women with babies, women with jeans, women with niqab, every single type of woman. And they've been in the lead of many, many of the protests and many of the NGOs and the groups that have, uh, that have been, that have organized uh, this, uh, this revolution. And now, as the revolution is being taken to people's daily lives, in other words, as people are implementing um, the demand for what they want to see happen in their workplace, for example, and starting to form unions and syndicates and so on, women are at the front of all this. What I think people really, especially in the West, only in the West, need to uh, be aware of is that women are not seeing this revolution in gender terms. Um, there were 10 women's NGOs who very early on, because of the questions that they kept being asked, issued a statement which basically said that these 10 feminist women's NGOs were issuing this statement as citizens of Egypt to say that their demands are the same as the demands of the revolution, da, 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 and that there should be no discrimination in anything on the basis of race or gender or ethnicity or, you know, whatever. So the, the, the principles of the revolution are totally in accord with non-discrimination. The actions of the revolution are in accord with non-discrimination, and women are completely part of it. Now, there are, of course, questions that will have to be dealt with, such as this, our latest, the regime, our latest government, put in a quota in parliament that 60 seats had to be for women. Now, a lot of women don't want that. You know, we believe that people should be elected on merit. And we believe that women in our society are not in a position where they need that handicap. We are already, what, 35% of our diplomatic corps is women. More than 50% of the people in media and in the arts are women. Um, you know, the teaching professions. I mean, you know, women are really in, we've never had um, to fight for equal pay for equal work, for example. You know, so essentially, we, of course, still have issues, but they are not issues that are particular to us. In fact, in terms of law, and probably in terms of position in the family, we, Egyptian women, are probably in a better place than, say, their American sisters. Okay? Now, in terms of who gets to do the washing up, Okay, well, that's an issue that has to be sorted in every household. That is an organic issue. It's not something that, you know. So um, I, I know that there is a point that this um, committee that was put together in order to alter the Constitution didn't have any women in it. But this committee was put together by the army, and everybody questions it. And it was only eight people. And it was only to change specific articles in order to have uh, to be able to have elections. So this committee doesn't mean anything. It, it, it's, you know, it's very, very, um, it's a bridging thing. And everything else that one has heard of happening, people are always aware of, you know, the, the, the woman issue and that they're, ha and it, it's, it's, it's okay, basically. We're fine and uh, <laughs> things can only get better as far as women are concerned. I mean, things are great and can only get better. So, so that's totally fine. I must say, though, also, that the issues are economic, truly. Yani, in any situation, if you have economic power, you are OK. And if you don't have economic power, then you stand much more risk of being suppressed and oppressed and beaten and downtrodden and all the rest of it. So you know, that, that, that is something also very much to bear in mind. Um, uh, I can't even see. Uh, you revol asked, asked about the, oh, about the revolution the right. being controlled and Israel. Yes. Well, you know what? I honestly don't care what Tony Blair says <laughs> about anything. I think Tony Blair should be in front of the criminal court. In the you know? Yeah. So, um, pff, yeah, I've I've no time for him at all. And um, uh, Israel. Now, of course, 
we hope very much that the uh, position of Egypt, the way Egypt positions itself vis-a-vis -vis Israel and the Palestinian question is going to alter radically. So, um, for a start, the Gaza siege is not going to be something that, that a, a government that is based on the will of the people and the government that represents the will of the Egyptian people will not continue uh, supporting and aiding and implementing the siege of the people of Gaza. That can't happen. And also, it can't carry on playing the extremely dirty and unpleasant games that it has been playing um, between Hamas and Fatah. And uh, you know, arming people and training people and supply and uh, you know all that stuff. I think also that before we even get to a serious question about Palestine, a government that is ruling or running Egypt for the benefit of the Egyptians will come up against issues to do with Israel as far as Egypt is concerned, and that will bring America in as well. So, our gas, for example. What sense does it make to be selling our gas to Israel at whatever it is, and sort of basically almost paying them to take it, Yang? Huh? While we could obviously use it ourselves, and while the price, I mean, that just can't happen. And it's not even just the issue of using gas. It is that because we are not able to use our own natural gas, because we have to sell it to them, we are using more electricity than we should from the high dam, which means that we are using more water than we, you know, and, and that gives us problems with our neighbors in the Nile Valley, which we really have to work on. That's, that's an area that we absolutely have to work on to rebuild our friendship with um, the countries of the Nile Valley. For example, why would we lease choice agricultural land in Egypt to Israel? talking about transfer of technology and how we, we in Egypt who've been planting Egyptian soil for 7,000 years, suddenly need the Israelis to show us how to plant. What, you know, how does this make sense? Huh? But in selling prime locations to companies that are, uh, you know, fronted by other people but are really Israel. How come we can't deploy our army and we can't develop Sinai? How, how can we, uh, so talking about sovereignty, you know, so, even in order to sort out our Egyptian issues, we are going to come into a confrontation with Israel, which will show whether Israel is prepared to deal with a genuine democracy on its border or whether it has problems with that. And certainly also our borders with Gaza are a question of our own sovereignty. So that is going to be a very interesting one to watch. And I think it will be very much a litmus test for whatever uh, you know elected body comes to power in Egypt. It will be very important. I can't wait to see Egypt on the international stage, because it's kind of been, yeah. it's been off the Palestine has been neutralized for absolutely. years. Absolutely. Um, OK, I'd, um, the gentleman there, and then I'm going to come to the lady there, and then the gentleman who's standing up at the back. Yes. yes. Will. <laughs> you have to keep your answers shorter, and that way I'm we'll so get sorry. through more okay. of the questions. It'll be yes and no. Give me multiple choice okay. answers. <laughs> OK. Could I just take you back to your very interesting description of the low-tech decision-making process in, in the square with, with the microphone and the unfurling balance and all the rest of it. Could you just stick that in the context of all, you know, all the, the blogging and the SMS text messaging and Facebook and, and everything that was going on as well? Uh, I mean, was there a point where all that new high-tech stuff didn't matter anymore? Or, or, or what, what was going on, particularly when you're out on the street? Thank you. Uh, lady there? Yeah. Um, I wanted to take issue with you on the question of women, actually. Could um, I see I'm where here. you are? I'm oh, here. Hi. Right. And, um, uh, you know, um, I think I'm not speaking as a feminist. I agree with your overall approach. But, um, uh, you know, coming from Turkey, where um, over the past 10 years, we have seen under AK Party, which is a moderate Islamic party, um, very traditional uh, 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 role of women reinforced to the point where violence against women is now completely out of control. 
um, and um, uh, Turkish women in the labor force are amongst the lowest in the world. So um, with high unemployment and, and so on, these traditional uh, ways of thinking about women's role, and now you're going to have um, a, a political space where these uh, sort of traditional and with, the, with a possibly an Islamic veneer put on it, roles of women will be reinforced. Um, you know, we have a prime minister going around saying all women should have at least three babies. And so, sorry, you know, so, so, so your sorry. point is your worry is yeah. that Egypt will, uh, the, the tr I, women but, in but Egypt are going to be... But you're not conscious enough. I think the, the, the women's question should be kept very much okay. at the fore. Okay, thank you. thank you so much. And the gentleman who's standing up at the, uh, at the back, yeah, go ahead. Hi, uh, my question is, uh, you know, uh, you were saying that there was some sort of sympathy for President Mubarak that if he agreed to step down, let him stay on until September. Uh, do you think possibly the transition may have been uh, sort of smoother, uh, could have been any smoother had they let him kind of continue and had like a, a government in waiting sort of to kind of deal with, you know, come up with policies Thank and you. stuff. And okay, and one, and Thank I'd you. have one, one last um, one yes. in this section. Yes, uh, lady there. Hi. I think this would be the shortest question. Uh, what if the army didn't take the side of the revolution? Um, what if it had what it? If, yeah. Mm. And uh, the other things, actually, in Middle East, we cannot believe the romantic picture about uh, people, um, protesters, and um, the army uh, on the street. So uh, we believe that there have been a plan. Uh, army already arranged for that to take the action at that time and okay. at that moment. Okay. So Thank what you. do you think about this? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. More. <laughs> we haven't got that. Can I ask you to answer those, Adavlis, because there's so many. We have only got two microphones, so it takes a long time for them to get. Okay, we'll, come right. back. we'll come back to you okay. in, uh, in a second. Let, let me do the, the, the technology thing and tie it into something that I didn't uh, that I didn't answer before. Actually, I'm going to pass this again to, to, to one of the younger people here about the, about the technology. There was, of course, uh, the point when the government cut, you know, shut down the internet and shut down the mobiles and, and so on. And of course, the revolution continued and happened and, 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 and everything without, without any of that, although there, were, there was the odd pocket. And to just link that to the writing process and then uh, take it. Um, yeah, well, I basically, uh, I wrote to commission. I mean, basically, like, The Guardian would call and say, I mean, I knew I should write a diary, but of course, I wasn't actually going to because one doesn't, um, but, but then... You're too busy on the streets. Well, yeah, and also, I mean, you know, you'd sort of sooner do anything rather than write. Um, and, uh, but Hearts then, are breaking around the room to, to hear you say that. But then the Guardian call and say, you know, can you turn in a piece by, uh, you know, today about, and you say, well, when do you want it? And it's sort of 6 o'clock their time, so 8 o'clock my time. And so, um, at, at, of course, in the first few days, there was no technology. And so basically, I scooted around looking for a hotel that had a functioning fax. And they had a, 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 a line that worked. And I called the Guardian, and I said, could you give me a fax number? And they had to look for a fax number. <laughs> and then I sort of went off and joined the revolution. That was the on the 28th, the Friday the 28th. And at, sev at sort of uh, like yeah, a quarter to seven, I had to run away and go home and type out my piece and print it and then run off to this hotel and send it by fax. Um, now, there were times when I was in Tahrir, and to get out of Tahrir by itself would take an hour and use up every bit of energy that I had. And so I would sit on the ground there, and I would write out my piece. And then I would either dictate it down, down the phone. This was when we got the phones back. <laughs> it was possible then to dictate it down the phone which was exhausting, of course, and, and it was not at all like sort of standing with a fedora in a sort of black and white movie, sort of, you know, talking out of the corner of my mouth. It was really like <laughs> yelling into the thing. Um, and there was once when I tried to text message it, and, and that also was just horrible, oh. the touch, touch thing. Um, <laughs> we had no idea what you went through. No, it, it we really, were happily really reading was, all these pieces. Yeah. And then even, even when the technology came back, my technology failed, and so I had this USB 
where technically I could have sat there and sent the thing, but my USB wouldn't work. And so, um, yeah, so basically I wrote two commission. I finished sort of like two minutes before it was due to go in. And, and, and one interesting thing about the writing process, if anybody's still interested in that, is um, the day that Mubarak left, um, we didn't know what was going to happen, and we kept hearing that he was going to speak. And I knew from the day before that if I was in the square, I wouldn't hear properly, and how would I rush back and file? And I had to file by a certain point. So I was sort of in front of the television at home, but fully dressed, so that when he spoke, I could. And so then I thought, well, OK, why don't I kind of be clever? And I will write a piece that I can then just put an ending to <laughs> when he either goes or doesn't go. <laughs> and so then I can sort of put my ending and run out and be in the street. So then um, so I wrote this thing, and I sort of stood there. And then he came on, and then he said he, uh, he was leaving. And so everybody, my brother, everybody who was in the house said, OK, bye. You know, we're off to Tahrir. And off, or, or they even went before, actually. You know, they went just before. And, uh, and then I found that that piece wouldn't work, that I actually had to rewrite. I had to write a new piece. Because that piece that was written in a kind of, it'll work either way, way was just no good. And the whole thing had to be done and then and, and sent. So that's a, now on this technology issue, um, I, I don't know if, I mean, do you want to very quickly say whether yeah. it matters? Whether well, it, so it's, yeah, so it's almost impossible to answer that very quickly, the, 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 the role of technology, if any, and so on. But uh, come tomorrow to the, uh, <laughs> to the thing <laughs> and where we'll discuss this extensively. Um, but yeah, the big lesson was that it, although it appeared or it did play a very big role in mobilizing on the 25th when they completely cut down the, the I mean, at every moment we are a digital uh, generation, we're always texting and always using the internet. So we think, obviously, that it's very important. But when they cut it off completely, we just manage to do it anyway. So. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. On the issue of women, I will accept that maybe I personally am Pollyanna-ish about it. But even if I am, there are many, many women out there and men who are keeping an eye on on this issue. So uh, you and know. The transition. Um, and then we transition. come. This is the issue of women in traditional roles. Would the transition have gone more smoothly if Mr. Mubarak had stayed in power? You can bet it wouldn't. There would have been blood in the streets. The security, they would have hung us from the lampposts, I tell you. You know? No, it would not have. It's a very, very good thing that he wasn't allowed to stay on. And uh, thinking that the army had planned it all along, well, you know, I mean, basically they would, I don't know, they would have to be, uh, yani, super, super natural to, to plan to that the army should move 18 million people around the streets and depose a government. I don't think that's possible. I believe that what is likely is that the army, and in fact, as it turns out, this turned out to be the case, that the army had a plan in readiness that how would they deploy, how would they act, you know, which streets would the tanks go into in the event of, because it didn't, you know, it was very clear for years that something was bound to happen. The question was when and what shape would it take. So the army knew how it would behave if this happened, and that's what we saw. And if they hadn't taken the side of the people, then of course we would have had massacres, but then the Egyptian army would have blotted its reputation forever. And I don't think that's something that, that they would really ever, ever want to do. I mean, I, it couldn't have happened. Really, it couldn't have happened. So, um, so the soldiers are conscripts. Exactly. This is a conscript army, yeah. you know? Okay. So the soldiers are, it's the draft. The soldiers are there, they're, they're our children who are serving a year or two years in the army. So that's, that makes a great big difference to how an army will, it's not the mercenaries that they have, you know, in Libya. Hmm. Okay, let's take some more questions. Um, do you have a mic? Uh, oh, yes, so um, if you could go ahead and then we'll come to the lady there and then we'll get the microphone to a couple more people. Uh, I'm just wondering what you thought were the... Uh, could you put the mic a little yeah, a bit closer? What would have to happen for the Rafi crossing to be opened? What Thank Rafa. you. And yes, if you could go ahead, and there's a, la there's a lady just there as well. Yes, go ahead. I wanted to ask on your aspirations for a change in the policy towards Israel, how much the American aid package is going to tamper with this? Thank you, and uh, lady there? Hello, um, my question relates to um, 
Why do you think the revolution in Egypt has succeeded uh, where the Libyan one is, is struggling? And what are, what are your views um, in terms of the Western response to both countries, Libya and Egypt? Libya and Egypt, thank you very much. And um, yes. Um, Hi, uh, I set up an organization, the New Egypt Organization, with a group of um, very frustrated Egyptians, uh, London-based, who wanted to be there, but unfortunately we couldn't. Um, please see our website if anyone's interested. And um, basically we've been um, supporting fundraising the injured protesters and lobbying the government to get the rights for Egyptians abroad to vote um, and the assets frozen, of, um, which luckily has been taken care of last week. Um, but in the meantime, what do you think we can do? What is it that you think that from here um, on the ground that we can do? I'm going to Egypt soon, but I just to assess it myself. The Egyptian diaspora. I, yeah. What do you think it is that are best? Okay. Um, Thank you. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, right. Rafa, I think perhaps the first thing that needs to happen is that we have a, a proper government that can, because the government we have now is, is, a, is, a, is a transitional <laughs> government. It's meant to just keep things going until we have an elected government, so it can't do anything very big. It can <coughs> indicate directions, but nothing very big. But once we have a government, then that will, that will be the pressure. Uh, and I, I think it would be extremely odd if, uh, if uh, the situation at Rafah remained as it is. I don't think that can happen. But the first thing is to get an elected mm. government. Um, Israel, uh, policy towards Israel and how much USAID will, well, you know, I, these, these, these are the big questions. Of course, there are uh, many among us who would like USAID to stop, basically stop giving us money. You know, it would be very nice if they stopped giving Israel money as well, of course. Um, but essentially, their money has been no good for Egypt. I mean, the kids you know, in, in, in the field hospital at the edge of Tahrir, the little mosque that was turned into a, a makeshift hospital for the wounded and the killed, people were, were holding up the uh, bullet casings. Um, there, were the, there, uh, there was live ammunition, there were rubber bullets, and there were uh, the, sh the shotgun things that scattered into um, many, many pellets that lodged everywhere. And they were holding up these casing and saying, look, this is what, this is what we get from American AID. You know, they're all made in the USA. And it, it's very, it's a metaphor, it's very pertinent, yeah. So, um, of course, there will be pressure um, from America about Egypt's policies towards Israel. And of course, that will have to be withstood. And that's just a process that, that, we, will, that we will have to go through. Um, but I think that it, it really will involve um, saying that that we don't that we don't want their money. Um, so I mean I, I can't answer that. I, I can I can tell you what the people want, and I can tell you that everybody believes that USAID has been bad for the country. Now, where we go from there and how that is worked into policy, that that has to come. Um, Libya. The Libyans and, and why they are struggling and the Western response to both this and that. Well, Libya is a very, very different situation. Um, uh, there's the demography. There's the fact that Egypt is actually a very coherent state. And that as we were just discussing this actually last night, and that the, the revolution in Egypt was to rescue the state to take the state back from the regime that was controlling it. Whereas in Libya, they are in the unfortunate position of having to create a state. There are hardly any institutions. It's all being pulled apart. Um, in Egypt, the army is an institution. It's a genuine army. In Libya, the army is all Mr. Qaddafi's personal army with you know, mercenaries, people paid. So it's, it is, a, uh, unfortunately, it's a very, very different situation. Um, intervention. Again, it's a difficult issue. Uh, in principle, of course, I and everybody I know is against military intervention, particularly from the West, particularly from NATO. The fact is that because of the revolutionary situation we're in, nobody, um, nobody in the Arab world was in a position to actually do anything. Qatar is sending a few planes. Um, and the difficulty is, of course, that the Libyan op rebels or opposition actually asked for the intervention. And so you can't say to them, well, no, you know, it would be better for you in the long run to, to not have it. You know, I, because they kind of know that, but they think that they can, that they can circumvent it. So it's, um, 
it's hard and it's been interesting to see, I mean obviously um, to, to see the way that that governments in the West have responded to to the different revolutions um, and to see the Americans trying to find the position and trying to not be wrong-footed and to see at the same time the people I was just in America and there isn't anybody that I met who found out that I was Egyptian, starting from taxi drivers to people in shops to people who came, who was not sort of totally like sort of, you know, inspired and dazzled and wanting a bit of it, you know? Um, it's really, honestly, I mean, you have taxi drivers, a taxi drivers sort of turning around, they're sort of practically going to crash the car because they want to see what this person in the back looks like who has come from Egypt, you know? And they're saying, uh, you know, you done saved all them children and grandchildren. And you say, oh, thank you very much. And he says, well, <laughs> well, but you might have saved all the children and grandchildren of the whole world. You know, I mean, that is really how people feel. They feel that <laughs> even in Western democracies, the will of the people so often does not carry the day. And we've seen that, the war on Iraq, the cuts, the government cuts, uh, um, climate change and the whole sort of environmental thing. And so people everywhere are puzzled as to how do the people change policy? How do you do it? And, you know, it is in that context that um, that you see the revolution. It's been very interesting here, of course, that uh, Mr. Cameron goes running off to Egypt. Uh, the revolution isn't yet cold, and he's out there with his arms merchants. You know, what is this? I mean, you know, anyway. So, um, yeah. And finally, uh, the diaspora. What? Yes. What can what can we do? Okay. Well, following on from the last, one thing you can do is behave as British citizens, and work to improve the system here. That is really important. Work to have more say here and work to improve the system here through all the democratic means available to you. That's one thing. And then as far as Egypt itself is concerned, well, you're going to go and see. I think fundraising for the uh, injured is excellent. I think you might like to have a word with my friend, Dr. Maji Hassawi, who is also organizing something like that and is in beginning to. Um, and, uh, and yeah, the um, the website is. I, I think cohesiveness and building networks so that whatever people decide to do, other people learn about it and can benefit from it. I think that is really, really important, and we have to find a way of. Um, and maybe even through the consulate, since we're now um, uh, on very positive terms with our consulate. Um, that <laughs> Mr. Amr uh, and there we go. <laughs> yeah, Welcome. the Revolutionary Consulate of Egypt, you know, let's work, let's work together. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. I think this might have to be the last round of questions. Sure. So please raise your hands. Um, um, lady here and um, other hands, yes. Um, one question at the back and one right at the front as well. We'll get the microphone to you in just a second. Yes. Why do you think that Egypt has really captured the hearts and minds of people to such a degree? I mean, all the other revolutions are happening at the moment, but we're, we're really excited, in love with Egypt, I think, as, as no other revolutions. And maybe that's the wrong oh. thing, but I... Oh. No, but it's, you know... <laughs> now that you've saved the And, and I wonder whether, to, to, what, to what degree, um, people like you, and I, this is a, you know, I do mean this with all my heart, great flattery to you, because you are very, a very important writer, but there are so many important writers and intellectuals who we've read about over the years, and I just wonder whether that's also helped us to, to, you know, to be with you in spirit as well, I think. Thank you. And um, Thank question you. at the back? Um, I believe there's quite a bit of, some bit of a scapegoating that's going on right now with, um, like, previous ministers that were business. Can you just hold the so microphone on. a bit closer? Thank yeah. you. Um, so I was just wondering what your view is on that and how um, the media in Egypt can be controlled a bit better to provide more factual information instead of rumours. Okay. Thank you. Your, your question. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, um, down here front, um, to what extent you thought that the, the, the revolution was against the regime as opposed to the system? And whether it was as well as against the regime, you know, the, the politics and the politicians, was it also against the system, the, the sort of capitalist system um, that you see being replicated globally? Okay. Thank you. Um, 
So there's three. Yeah. I think. Is I that it? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I think this will be the first. Uh, anyway, good. Right. Um, okay. The the uh, you know I don't know about scapegoating. I think that uh, I think that the media, of course, could do better in every possible way. The media was was very very wrong and corrupt in the way that it dealt with the revolution, in the way that it lent itself to uh, the scaremongering, the divisive tactics, the sectarian tactics of the regime and played along with them. Um, and um, so basically the media needs cleaning up anyway. So, you know, but I honestly don't know that anybody is is being scapegoated. I know that people are, uh, of course, uh, you know, in jail and people are being tried. I think that more people should be. I think there is a certain selectivity in in who is being um, uh, jailed, and I think that there are a lot of people who are not jailed who should be jailed and who should be tried. But I do believe that the system that people will be tried under will probably be quite fair. I think, in fact, it will probably be leaning towards letting people off rather than um, you know than, than being harsh towards them so and that's a good thing um, it's kind of turning into an anti-capitalist um, attitude um, well I don't know that you can actually say that because what is the media I mean there are so many channels out there there are so many newspapers there are so many so which media is it that is anti-capitalist and if it is then well and good because it has been pro-capitalist for so long so maybe this is a, you know maybe this is a kind of redressing of, mm -hmm. of the balance but I don't think you can actually make blanket statements about the media as a whole because they differ they vary enormously you know, and you can really more or less find uh, a sympathetic, a viewpoint sympathetic to your own, if if you look through through the spectrum, as far as I can tell. Um, the question about why, well, why oh, do we love why Egypt? do we love Egypt? <laughs> yes, uh, I know yeah, it's a no, serious absolutely. question. I really do know it's a serious question, and I've been yeah. Well, let me take this other one first about whether we let me end with 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 that yeah, because that's a sort of a, a broader, bigger question. Um, yes, I do believe that the revolution is against the system. It's it's against uh, what this. I mean. What made this regime bad, of course, was the brutality and the corruption, as well as inefficiencies and so on, but brutality and corruption. And the things that we saw happening to Egyptian society under this regime were exacerbated versions of things that are happening everywhere, but exacerbating. So the, the difference between rich and poor um, becoming enormous, people just really being dropped out of any account of what society should be about. Uh, and then, of course, for us, the degradation of our systems of education, our systems of health, etc., etc. Now, this is all very much tied to no-holds-barred free market capitalism, which is, in our case, connected intimately with corruption. And this revolution is against that. So people are saying, and we're saying from the beginning, that yes, this is about democracy, but democracy is not enough. It's not enough to simply be able to go through a process where you elect people. To, there has to be more than that. And that's what we are looking for, and that's what people are sort of working to, to devise. What economic system is, and, and there is no prevalent opinion at the moment. Of course, there is a prevalent bias towards um, what you could call social justice, towards a more equitable distribution of wealth, towards reinstating work as a value, um, towards limiting the power of money. That's all there. But how exactly are you going to do it? That is open to debate, and that is what will become clear as the country you know, debates what it's going to do and how it's going to run itself and what its institutions are going to look like and so on. But totally for these things. And so, yes, it is against the system, not just the, it's against the regime because of the system that the regime instituted. And finally, <laughs> OK, now it would be incredibly flattering to think that because some people have written fiction 
which people have, readers have liked, that has meant that people are more sympathetic to Egypt. It is a big question because it's also to do with, I mean, one thing that one says when challenged about the, the use of fiction or the use of film, say, is that the bottom line is that it makes you more empathetic. That if, that if you read a book and you, a novel, and you care, it keeps you entertained to the point of turning the pages and you care what happens to these characters, it has allowed you to exercise your muscles of empathy, of stepping into someone else's shoes, feeling for them and with them. And one would like to, to think, and I know, for example, that in, in, in my case, how, I mean, you know, wh whatever, however badly, say, Russia will be, behave, it can't ultimately be beyond the pale because there's Natasha and Pierre, you know? And so it is possible, of course, that through having read, you already have an empathy. I think that there are two uh, things here uh, beyond this. One is that the spectacle of the Egyptian Revolution was a spectacle. It was, it was done with such grace. And it was so relaxed. And it was so kind of nice to look at. And if you understood the jokes, it was funny. And, um, and, and yet it could raise its game and defend itself when you know, they came at it with, with bullets or with stones or whatever. It could defend itself. And as, as uh, my nephew was saying last night, that you, on, on the night of that Wednesday when they attacked, the peripheries of the square were fighting a battle, a very efficient and ferocious battle against the paramilitaries. And in the heart of the square, there were stand-up comics, you know? So that, I think that what you saw in Egypt was kind of humanity in diverse forms at its best. And that that was very attractive. And not because it's Egyptian, but because it's a human spectacle. It's humanity at its best in diverse forms. That's wonderful. Having said that, I also think that we have a bit of an unfair advantage in that everybody knows about Egypt. You know, you start reading about Egypt when you're little, and you know about the pharaohs, and you know about Cleopatra, and there's Tutankhamun, and there's, you know, and, and then, you know, people have been to Sharm, or people. In other words, Egypt already has a kind of uh, a baseline in people's hearts, and people wish it well. So it's like, you know, it's been so downtrodden and so sort of to see it now raise its game and, and be about to be okay, you know, it brings all that. I mean, people have, have said to me, oh, but we've been to your country and, you know, we had no idea. Or we've been to your country and we were told that people don't mind being poor because they're going to go to heaven and they'll be okay there, <laughs> you know. I mean, just sort of, and they felt uncomfortable about it. And suddenly, suddenly, Everybody in the world can feel good and hopeful about this place that they already have an idea of and has a place in their hearts because of history. And I think we've been tremendously lucky with that. And I think that, you know, the, the, the really true thing to say about that is that Egypt has always considered that it is not just for Egyptians. I mean, Egypt sees itself very, very much as sort of essentially a contributor to humanity in general. And part of what was hurting us so much for the last 40, 50 decades was the spectacle that we were cutting on that universal stage. And a great part of, of our relief and our happiness now, and that was expressed in the square, huh, was that people are looking at us, people are deriving hope and inspiration from us. And when those placards went up in Wisconsin, saying this is Tahrir and walk like an Egyptian, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that was great. So it's brilliant. Thank you so much.